For some reason that we'll probably never fully understand, an extraordinary outpouring of energy began to occur around the year 1100. It was so powerful and so passionate that it transformed the way the world looked and thought about God, about justice and power, about women, love and art. This story starts with the almost unbelievable life of the woman we will come to know as Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor had virtually everything this life can grant. Sunlit beauty, inherited power and wealth on a phenomenal scale. Kings as husbands, kings as sons. She lived an epic life in the middle of a whirlwind, entangled with five mightily powerful men who fought for more than a century to control Western Europe. Surrounding them is an incredible array of people who lived in that world doing incredible things, from building stone cathedrals that streamed with sunlight, to fighting two crusades, to inventing fictional characters we still read about. We know of only a few of them, and what we do know of even these favoured few is limited by their records and our own comprehension. Come with us as we journey to meet Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry Plantagenet, Richard Lionheart, King John, and all the remarkable people surrounding them. To be in their presence is an exhilarating experience. Won't you join us? Welcome back to Lion's Forge. My name is Beckett, and I want to tell you a story. An epic, true story of five kings and the Lion Queen. Episode 13, The Scandal of Antioch. Raymond's hospitality was unstinting as his new friends dined at his table and hawked his spectacular falcons across his endless lands. But the prince was not just playing the role of an exceptionally attentive host. He was passionately intent on having Louis help him get something Raymond badly wanted, the legendary trading city of Aleppo, stubbornly held in Arab hands. Whatever he had to do to make Louis gravitate toward this idea, Raymond would do. His ambition isn't hard to understand. Aleppo, so old it was believed the biblical Abraham had milked his cow in its streets on his way to Canaan, had become a key bastion of the Ad-Din dynasty, founded by the infamous Zengi, the great Arab warlord who took Edessa. After Zengi's murder, his empire had been split between his two boys, Saif and the younger Nur. Nur, like his father, was a frighteningly tough Saracen warrior. He was now the strong man of Aleppo, just over the near horizon from Antioch. Needless to say, he was quite the unwelcome neighbor. Raymond wanted him gone. And there was myth in it as well, since there was a prophecy that whoever conquered Aleppo would win the prized crown of Jerusalem, the richest and strongest of the Latin states. The prince must have had it all sorted out in his mind. Louis had brought tens of thousands of crusaders this far to take Edessa back. Aleppo was on the road to Edessa. By taking Aleppo from Nur, the Europeans would gain more control over their supply lines, while Raymond would reap power and wealth, kick hard at the Moorish armies which eternally menaced him, and free himself from some galling feudal obligations to his sworn liege, the Byzantine emperor. It made perfect sense. The confident Raymond spent two months wooing his European cousins, weeks and weeks of public feasts and ceremonies, expensive gifts smilingly bestowed, amiable private talks over pistachios, wine, and honeycomb during the long, searingly hot afternoons. His efforts quickly gained Alionor's public support, marking one of the very few times Alionor's views on government policy were ever mentioned by chroniclers. In due course, a full war council of French and Antiochene nobles was called, where Raymond was given the floor to present his already well-known thinking on the Aleppo campaign. 
he probably rose to his feet in that assembly room with the easy certainty that his European comrades, charmed for weeks by now, would rally to him. Raymond, however, was wrong. The French would not stop to take Aleppo while on their way to Edessa. In fact, it was suddenly announced that they weren't going to Edessa at all. Instead, they had somehow decided to turn entirely away and travel 300 miles in another direction to Jerusalem, a city that was firmly in European hands, wasn't under threat, and had never figured in anyone's plans for this crusade. Viewed calmly and objectively, Edessa's situation had changed radically since it famously fell to Zengi on Christmas Eve of the year 1144. In 1146, there had been a rebellion to try to restore the defeated Jocelyn, but Zengi's son Nur had crushed it. As seems to be the depressingly frequent case, the victorious army destroyed its conquest in the process of winning it. One chronicler described Edessa in Nur's wake as an appalling vision, enveloped in a black cloud, infected by cadavers. The carnage was so ghastly that witnesses would swear vampires had been drawn from their graves to picnic on the unburied corpses. Trading their lives for a pile of vampire-haunted ruins had little immediate appeal to the French, who had already seen more than their share of wreckage and woe. Louis was fresh from Mount Cadmos. He had no heart for attacking someone like Nur ad-Din. Nor was there any perceptible benefit to the Europeans in helping Raymond march just far enough to go after Aleppo. European lives and treasure would be spent, but the reward would melt into the realm of the Prince of Antioch. Even crusaders were prey to annoyance at being asked to risk their lives to make someone else richer. So retaking Edessa now was pointless on the one hand and very likely impossible on the other. As for Jerusalem, devout Louis had always wanted to make a pilgrimage there. Years earlier, he had reportedly told friends that he would fulfill his late brother Philip's pledge to pray in the holy city. Now that he was only a few hundred miles away, Louis may have decided he would never have the opportunity again. Possibly, his narrow escape on Mount Cadmos made him believe he owed God his own pilgrimage of thanks. Louis also had news that Conrad, the German leader, recovered from his Dorylaeum wounds, was sailing from Constantinople to Jerusalem. Crusade historian Jonathan Phillips additionally believes that even with Raymond's feasts and gifts, having the army remain much longer in Antioch was an expensive proposition, so much so that the Templars were on the verge of bankruptcy in the wake of huge, unpaid loans they had made to the French. Staying in this expensive city was becoming a financial impossibility, no matter how much one might enjoy Raymond's wines. Even so, the earnest explanations never quite gel. Even if Louis was utterly determined to make his devotions in distant Jerusalem, leaving the ambitious Nur in control of Aleppo was a genuine, unresolved threat to Christendom's Latin kingdom. Then, too, winning the city and its fantastic bazaars would help make up for the blistering loss of Edessa. Not only would the Outremer's borders be extended, but Aleppo sat at the perfect midpoint between the Mediterranean coast, the Euphrates River Basin, and wondrous Egypt. The city had been an invaluable holding since caravans had first traveled the earth. Its perfect location, not to mention the rivers of wealth its location generated, would vastly enrich any victor. And it was right there, little more than a stone's throw to the east. So again, why would Louis turn his back on Raymond's proposal? Even Eleanor, 
rarely quoted by chroniclers, was vocally supportive of her uncle. But Louis refused. Instead, he took his army out of the crusade, at least as this crusade had always been understood, planned, and executed. The crusaders would leave Antioch not to fight the Moors, but to make a pilgrimage to peaceful Jerusalem. The reason for it? A storm of gossip at the time and whispered down the lane for more than 850 years is that Louis learned that his wife was sleeping with Raymond. Two of the main chroniclers of the day, William of Tyre and John of Salisbury, writing years later, each reported this as a fact. The circumstances were slightly different in each account. William said outright that she disregarded her marriage vows and was unfaithful to her husband. We don't know where William heard it. The generally reliable John of Salisbury implies that Raymond, so often being seen in his niece's company, both of them presumably looking pleased with themselves, was proof enough of sin. Suspicion even fed on her vocal support of her uncle's Aleppo campaign. It's certainly possible that these handsome royal relatives were entranced by each other, tired of their respective spouses and lives. Eleanor would need some warm pleasure after the fright and cold of Anatolia, and her uncle was a compelling object of infatuation. Raymond, although he enjoyed a rare reputation for marital fidelity, would not be the first man seduced by the allure of a famous French beauty. Stress, after all, can often be alleviated, in the right bed. Antioch marks Eleanor's emergence as a star on history's grand stage. Before Antioch and Raymond, despite the fact that she was a great heiress and a queen, the most notable female ever to accompany a crusade, she's rarely mentioned. Historian Jonathan Phillips gives an almost day-by-day account of Conrad, Louis, and their crusading peers in his book The Second Crusade, but Eleanor, feudal head of the Aquitanians, barely makes an appearance. Nor did the contemporary chroniclers have much to say about her before Antioch. Until now, she's been veiled from us, a granddaughter and daughter of remarkable men, then a queen, but a queen without a son. The Aquitaine was hers, but she fought no battles over it, and, as was common when lords married dynastic heiresses, her husband actively ruled her lands. She had married into a family where women rulers were absolutely barred. Accordingly, before Antioch, the lady had done nothing that would impress the princes of Europe. Aside from being a great heiress and a great beauty, who had made an appropriately great marriage, there was little to distinguish her from dozens of other noblewomen of her time. Vézelay had changed her life at the age of 21, but it took two more years for the new woman to emerge. It was Antioch, specifically stories of rebellion and adultery in Antioch, that broke her free. It's still difficult to sort out why Eleanor of Aquitaine generated such vicious gossip, accused not only of infidelity, but infidelity on a monstrous scale. In Antioch, tongues wagged that this wedded queen had taken as a lover her married uncle Raymond, an outrage against two kingdoms. There would be much more over the years. One story invented a century after both parties died, tarred her with having slept with a religious and military enemy of her entire race, the Arab prince Saladin. It's difficult for us to grasp the depravity this would represent to the medieval European mind. Muslims were considered such reprobates and friends of Satan, as they were called, that a sexual liaison with one would be the height of sinful abandon. In reality, Saladin was an 11-year-old boy when the adult Eleanor was in Constantinople, 
and the two were unlikely even to have seen each other's face. Yet, the story of their affair was firmly linked to her, repeated a thousand times for a thousand years. The accusations against her went far beyond even Raymond and Saladin. She'd be accused of sleeping with her second husband's father, not to mention seducing husband two before leaving husband one. Supposedly, she had affairs with a close friend of the family named William Marshall, one of the greatest knights of the day, and with yet another uncle, an Aquitanian government official named Rolf de Fay. In essence, the rich, beautiful, and unusually powerful Aquitanienne was the sinful female personified. Historian David Crouch has said that adultery among the great and famous was a salacious 12th century fascination. Medieval epics were hardly worth reading if they neglected to tempt the hero with an opportunity to sleep with the great lord's wife. It's not hard to see why slipping the often galling bonds of medieval matrimony was such a popular fantasy. Take arranged marriages that often were little more than economic deals, add women under lifelong male control, lengthy spousal absences, cohabitation of many young men with relatively few ladies, male rivalry, and sheer boredom. Then, too, everyone knew that women by their very nature were immoral thoughtless, vain in their charms, prey to flattery and entirely untrustworthy. As historian Jane Dunn wrote of England's Elizabeth I and her own problems with sexual gossip, it was a historic and religious tradition that sexual attraction between a man and a woman was invariably seen as the woman's responsibility. Women were, after all, the descendant of Eve, That simple fact guaranteed that heedless disobedience to God's law was in every female's blood. To seal her supposed reputation, Eleanor, Queen of France, Duchess of the Aquitaine, was not only another sinful daughter of eternal Eve, but one free of most normal female constraints. Chroniclers had to be stunned by her wealth, wealth which made her powerful and power could make her capable of almost anything. Some wrote of her with the musk of her lustful grandparents in their twitching nostrils. Some heard rumors from the inevitable people who jealously didn't like her. Some were appalled that she had taken it upon herself to accompany an army. Some probably just enjoyed the fun of creating even racier stories than the ones already in circulation. We know, given her famous comment of years later, that she had found herself married to, quote, more of a monk than a man, unquote, that Louis was an unsatisfactory husband in whatever way a monk more than a man might be. In our day, it comes across as a self-evident sexual insult, and even his contemporaries may have taken it that way given an old story that Louis was considered so pious, people joked he wouldn't have committed adultery to save his life. On the other hand, it may have been simply her frustrated lament that Louis would rather pray on his knees than hunt, dance, eat, or laugh. By the time they reached Antioch, Eleanor, born of a family of warriors, had spent months watching Louis's inept leadership of his men, crowned by the army's near collapse. Even his soldiers grumbled at his lack of elan. She could scarcely have been more impressed with this king than his own men were. Yet Eleanor of Aquitaine, often a risk-taker of epic proportions, was never mindless. Even the easy-going Poitavans would have thought poorly of an adulterous queen, and, in light of the gossip that already stirred two continents, an ill-timed pregnancy would have been unthinkable. Nor did Louis react as a cuckold king might be expected to act, with swift repudiation, imprisonment, or repatriation to the Aquitaine. 
he would remain married to her for another four years. Rather than outright adultery, the reality probably involved an unhappy and naturally flirtatious young beauty, giddy at her reception by a sympathetic hero, combined with an unhappy husband who just then had a great many reasons to doubt his authority over anything, including his marriage. If there was ever fertile ground for marital doubt, jealousy, and anger, this would be it. Whatever the truth of Eleanor's relationship with Raymond, it's universally agreed today that the end of the French royal marriage was first raised by Eleanor amid the storm of Antioch gossip, a storm powerful enough to reach the Pope's ears. There may well have been furious arguments in their quarters. One common version of what happened has Eleanor icily informing her husband that she would stay in Antioch with Raymond, while Louis could go as he wished, whether that was Edessa, Jerusalem, or back to Paris. It doesn't seem that she argued about any emotional hole in the marriage, instead declaring that she was unable to remain with Louis a day longer because their decade-old marriage was monstrously illegitimate. The two were so closely related that they should never have been lawfully permitted to marry in the first place. The medieval curse of consanguinity thus raised its talons over the French royal family. We should pause here. Consanguinity is the term for being too closely related to be permitted to marry by religious or civil law. We would say today that first cousins face such a restriction under civil law. In Eleanor and Louis' era, the Catholic Church made the rules regarding the degree of consanguinity considered a bar to a lawful marriage and had decided that being related to a potential spouse within seven degrees was the cutoff. This meant that having a great-great-great-great-great-grandparent in common was a problem. Given small populations, limited geographic range, and considerations of wealth and class, finding an appropriate spouse could be massively frustrating. As the generations continued to intermarry to preserve and enhance family fortunes, genealogists were hired specifically to labor over family trees when aristocratic unions were under consideration. Hugh Capet, the king of France generations before Louis and Eleanor, was forced to cast as far afield as Byzantine royalty for a bride for his son Robert, explaining in one offer letter that there was no suitable lady available to Robert because of Capetian kinship with all the neighboring kings. It might be possible to persuade the church to bend the rules, often in a scratch-my-back-and-I'll-scratch-yours exchange with a local bishop who needed something from the ruling family. The entire process was a source of cynicism in many quarters, as many nobles married knowing full well they were violating the rules. Later, when such marriages went wrong, the principals were shocked, very shocked, that they had married a fourth cousin, from whom they now piously felt they had to be annulled. There were unquestionably blood ties between Louis and Eleanor, dating back a century or so, but at the time of their wedding, celebrated with considerable pomp and splendor, with a thousand wedding guests looking on, no one had stepped forward to argue that Louis Capet and the Duchess of Aquitaine should take a pass because they were distant cousins. Nor had this supposed gigantic obstacle been mentioned when their daughter was born. The universal silence on the subject wasn't the product of simple ignorance the powerful of the time were well aware of the shadowy blemish over the marriage. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote a letter to a bishop in 1143, complaining that Louis used consanguinity as an excuse to forbid noble weddings he disliked, even though he'd gone ahead with his own when it too should have been prohibited. For Eleanor to raise it now as the reason they could no longer live under the same roof, and for Louis to respond with anything but dismissive laughter means that something deeper was going on. 
as word of this breathtaking marital conflict got out, and inevitably given the participants, observers gasped. One historian defines it as an extraordinary public breach, particularly between France's struggling king and his independently powerful queen. What had been set in motion was nothing less than a threat to the integrity of the French ruling family, and thus France itself. Either the king was a spineless cuckold, or he had always been illegally married. There was no way to probe the French queen's alleged adultery without marking the French king as a weakling, incapable of controlling his wife. So everyone turned instead to the validity of their marriage. The chronicler John of Salisbury wrote that it was believed the king was reluctant to contemplate divorce because he did love his beautiful, young, charming wife, a wife who happened to still possess the Aquitaine, because the couple had not had a son. Yet, at the same time, Salisbury also says that Louis privately and cautiously agreed that he would consent to divorce her if his counselors and the French nobility would allow it. Given that the Aquitaine would revert to Eleanor's control if the marriage ended without a son, this was a monumental decision on the king's part. Still, the first he debated as it often does, and calmer heads prevailed, at least on Louis's side. Images of her leaving with the Aquitaine came to mind, as did an appreciation of the public relations calamity that loomed if this disastrous crusade were capped with a divorce from the greatest heiress in Western Europe. According to Salisbury, even the king's body servant, Thierry Galeran, who had never liked Eleanor, vehemently advised the king that it would be a lasting shame to the kingdom if, in addition to all the other disasters, it was reported that the king had lost his heiress queen. It's hard to imagine how it was engineered, but however it was done, when Louis left Antioch, Eleanor traveled with him. There's no clarity to stories of the departure. Eleanor's biographer, Amy Kelly, refers to the queen as a captive and says the French snuck out of Antioch in the night. It's hard to square that image with Eleanor's status or with Louis's temperament, but whether she went voluntarily or not, her uncle Raymond had just spent months of his life and a goodly part of his treasury for nothing. The opportunity to knock Nur ad-Din back was lost forever. The chance to conquer Aleppo was gone. It takes very little to imagine that a humiliated warrior prince who could lift a warhorse seethed with resentment toward his recent guest, the King of France. For her part, Eleanor would never see Raymond again. He would die the following summer at Nur's hands and his principality would be overrun, just as he had feared. We've come to the end of our story for the time being. I am Beckett Arnold, narrating from the book Lion's Forge, adapted for us by the author Karen Markle Nab. Thank you to Francis Butt for voicing our introduction. If you like what you hear, please give us a rating, follow our channel, and share us with your friends. Most importantly, join us again November 13th for the next episode of Lion's Forge, available everywhere you get your favorite podcasts, streaming on YouTube with video episode trailers, and on Facebook, where you can ask questions, leave reviews, and interact with me.